Well, it's wonderful to be back, and we're so glad that you could join us for part two of this series, 1888, The Heart of Adventism. And uh, as we go on, I want to share with you uh, just a couple more topics. We outlined them at the first series, but I want to remind you that tonight is from zeal to real. How to move from being zealous for God to having a real authentic experience with God. That's what we pray you'll get out of this presentation. But also uh, the next presentation, presentation three, will be dealing with real righteousness. You don't want to miss that. That's a wonderful presentation. Uh, what kind of righteousness? How do I get the righteousness in order to be approved right in the eyes of God? Then we're going to deal with the covenants. Now, this has been a very, very interesting presentation, a very interesting topic uh, that we have wrestled with. And in Christendom, often we wrestle with it. But when we go through and deal with the covenants, I believe it's going to be a real blessing. Then we're going to talk about overcoming. How do we experience overcoming? We're dealing a lot about that justification and, and the beauty of digging deep into Jesus. But how does that manifest in my life? You don't want to miss that one, overcoming sin in the flesh. Then we're going to deal with perfection, uh, prophetic perfection. And you don't want to miss that presentation. It'll help us to understand what does it mean to be perfect uh, in the times that we're living in. Then justified for the judgment. Uh, how do we get through the judgment? That's a wonderful presentation. And then the shaking. Uh, the shaking. What does this mean for us who are living just before the time of Jesus' second coming? Don't miss that presentation. And the reason why I say it's a wonderful presentation, not because of the presenter, uh, but I say that because of the content uh, and the message that we have been given. In fact, I remember an old preacher, he said to me one time, he preached a sermon and he said, uh, and I said to him, I went up to him, I said, oh, thank you so much, Pastor. He was an old evangelist, but his name, he was a Stanley, uh, Pastor Ray Stanley. And he, I said, thank you so much, Pastor, for this wonderful sermon that you preached. And he grabbed my hand like I was a young little boy. And he looked at me and he said to me, we have a wonderful message. And it really hit me that the power of God is in the gospel. It's just our job to share it. And so I pray that we'll be blessed as we go into the Word again, this presentation, and look at the Gospel of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your presence. Even now, Lord, as we go into your Word, and through history we learn a little bit, we just ask that you may speak to us in ways uh, that we didn't even expect, that you may help us, Lord, to be Gospel-centered Christians, rooted deep down into Jesus and the lessons of the past. May they serve as a wonderful blessing for our future. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I want to go with you back. And if, if you've missed part one, you need to uh, find part one. I'm sure they'll show it again or you can find it here on YouTube. Uh, but notice here, uh, we spoke about the session in 1888 in Minneapolis. And we spoke about how uh, this was a special conference session where there was tensions and two young preachers started to preach about justification by faith. And those preachers, one was A.T. Jones, and the other one was E.J. Wagner. Now, what we saw, just recapping, in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God, his righteousness, is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. And so what we saw, Jesus has done something that unleashes the power of God. In it, we find the righteousness of God. And we can only access that through faith. Now notice what the response from the, the, the president was, and, and we don't say this to demean the president of the time. These were good men, but there was a misunderstanding that was going on. Praise God for repentance. But notice in that conference, Alda Butler felt called upon to send in telegrams and long letters. And this is the things he would say, stand by the old landmarks. In other words, they were afraid that if we focused too much on the 
gospel on the justification by faith that we would neglect the particular clear doctrines that have been discovered, like what happens when you die and, and these type of things. And so he was saying, stand by the landmarks because they were afraid that we would lose focus on these wonderful truths. But notice Ellen White's statement that we read. She, she said, this is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. It is the third angel's message, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice. So she's saying, this is the message that's to be given to the world. The context was justification by faith, uplifting Jesus. And she goes on, and attended with the outpouring of his spirit in a large measure. In other words, when we share the message with the heartbeat being justification by faith, we're going to see the spirit poured out in a large measure. Now notice as we go on, therefore, in Romans 5, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So having been, something Jesus has accomplished, therefore having been justified by faith, we now have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, this is our teaching passage today in Romans chapter 4, Romans 4 and verse 4, our teaching passage. And this is, an, I, I enjoy this passage. Notice with me, we're going to start in verse 4. What then shall we say that Abraham, our father, has found according to the flesh. What has he found? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So notice what it's saying. It's saying it wasn't by works. It was because he believed in God he was accounted righteous. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. In other words, it's very clear here, it's we're justified not by our works, but through our faith in Jesus Christ. Now notice, he gives an interesting example, and we jump through a couple of verses. Uh, the blessed man, the talk referring to David, quoting from Psalm 32, wonderful passage there, but I want to highlight something here. Notice what it says. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? So the question is, when do I get justified? Is it on those who are circumcised or upon those who are uncircumcised. Notice what he says, for we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckon, reckoned when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Now it's a good question because when is he reckoned righteous? When he's done something? When he's circumcised? Because circumcision was a sign of their faith toward God. Is it when he's circumcised, when he's done something? Or is it before he's even done something, he's circumcised? How was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Now notice Paul's response. Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. Before he had done anything... He is accounted righteous. Now, notice we jump to verse 11, and he received the sign of circumcision. Now, I want you to get that. So it's when you place your faith in Jesus before you do anything, but you turn and you rely upon, wholly upon him that you are accounted righteous 
And notice in verse 11, and he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of faith, which he had yet been uncircumcised. So what it's saying is, after he had received the grace of God, after he had been accounted righteous, he then got circumcised. In other words, then that work became a sign that he had become righteous, that he might be the father of all them that believe. Though they be not circumcised, that righteousness may be imputed unto them also. So in the end, he said circumcision didn't really matter. But he kind of used it to illustrate that if you don't have any good works to bring before God, and by the way, none of us have good enough works to recommend us to God. It's Jesus' merits that save us. And so when we come to Christ based on Jesus' merits, Jesus' wonderful works, and we receive that and are accounted righteous, praise God, and then we do something that gives glory to God, that becomes a sign or a seal. A sign that we have received God's righteousness. Abraham was reckoned or counted righteous when he believed. So when we believe in God, we're counted righteous. Now, here's some truths that I I just put down in my own words. Notice what it says. Believe in what he has done for you. You have been forgiven and restored to God. Jesus has done something so powerful that he has provided everything that's needed to restore you to God. Only the sacrifice of Jesus makes you right with God, and he has already done that. You're called to receive it. But you see, when we receive it, uh, we've got to grab it with both arms. Isn't that true? And sometimes in order to grab it with both arms, we've got to let the other things in life go and just say, Lord, you become number one in my life. God justifies the ungodly. We, we touched on that in part one, how God justifies the powerless, the ungodly, the sinners, and even those who are enemies of God. And your faith will testify to this. Just like they got circumcised later on, your faith will when you start to live for God, testifies to the fact that you've been accounted righteous through the righteousness of God. In other words, you have been forgiven and accepted at the cross, and He will grow you. Amen. He calls you to believe. So we're talking and have been focusing about getting the roots down deep. That's what we've been focusing on. Now, how are we made right with God? Now, if it's through our works... We don't need Jesus. Jesus was unnecessary. If it's through our works. If it's through Jesus and our works that we are justified. If it's through Jesus and our works that we're accepted before God. Then Jesus' sacrifice was not good enough. And neither is it a gift. But if it's through the works and merits of Jesus. God is worthy. Worthy is the Lamb. Christ alone, that early teaching of the Reformation, is the heartbeat of Seventh-day Adventism as well. It is the heartbeat of all Christians. The five solas, you know, Christ alone, faith alone, grace alone, amen. God's glory alone. Sola Scriptura. Now notice what her response was. How long, and this was to some of the church leaders, how long will you hate and despise the messengers of God's righteousness? Now, now notice what she's saying. How they, some of them were really struggling with this message. God has given them his message. They bear the word of the Lord. Now notice what she says here. There is salvation for you, but only through the merits of Jesus Christ, only through his accomplishments uh, 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 do we receive the salvation of God. So she was coming strong. The grace of the Holy Spirit has been offered you again and again. Light and power from on high have been shed abundantly in the midst of you. She said, God manifests himself in this place and you are rejecting the message from God. You must wholly rely upon the merits, the achievements of Jesus. Only through the merits of Jesus Christ is their salvation. What happened was after 1888, Ellen White 
A.T. Jones, E.J. Wagner, they started traveling through America and they would hire out halls and they would hire out different places. They would go to camp meetings and revival would start to break out. In fact, people would start to be moved and people would would weep and people's hearts would be drawn closer to God and revival started to spread. And, And some people really resented this. They really got upset. Until eventually what ended up happening was they split up Alan White, E.J. Wagner, and A.T. Jones. Now, by the way, I just want to mention this, is that the interesting thing is when we received Christ, it wasn't fanaticism. You know, people weren't getting all excited and, you know, jumping up and down and all this type of stuff. What happened, it just warmed the heart. It gave them security in Christ. They found their hope of salvation. In fact, I've seen it myself. When God's word goes forth and when people find their hope and is built on Jesus Christ. I mean, I remember one man I spoke to and when he heard and understood and he started sharing with me, he said, he said, Clifton, he said, I was about to leave God. I was about to throw it because I, 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 my life had become dry and, and, and like the valley of dry bones. He said, I was just going to walk away. He said, but today I found the hope in Jesus Christ of what he has done. And he found peace with God and, and he grasped hold of it. Praise God. And today he's serving God. And another man, uh, he came to me just recently. We were running some meetings and we were just sharing and teaching the scripture and what happened and, and, and the message. And, and as we were sharing, he came to me. In fact, he works in the forestries. And he was, he, as he was sharing, he said, you know, I really wanted to come to these meetings to see what they are about. He said, but I work every night. We, we go out. Uh, you know, in the forestry, sometimes they go out and they stay out in the cabins and then they come back into the city for the weekends. And, and he was out and he was, w- he was signed on to be at work. He said, but what happened was when he was at work the week before, he, he went to use the chainsaw or something and he, he couldn't move his arms and he had to go to the doctors and he was given a week off. And he said, praise the Lord. Hey? And when he was given the week off, he came to the meetings. And as he came to the meetings, I'll never forget it. As he was sharing with me, he had tears in his eyes. And he said, I just thank God for Jesus. You see, what what was happening is back in 1888, many of them were so zealous for God, but they were relying upon themselves. But when we find our hope in Jesus Christ, And what a wonderful joy it was. And so Alan White, A.T. Jones, E.J. Wagner, it was so deep that they wanted to stop the message so much that they split them up. And uh, we know E.J. Wagner went to England. A.T. Jones stayed in America. They were all on different continents. And Alan White, they really penalized her by sending her to Australia. What a terrible penalty, huh? But praise the Lord, she had a good time. She managed to get to New Zealand. So that was... That was good. What we see here is that the leaders were struggling. But I want to share something with you. Uh, Notice here in Romans chapter 10, Romans chapter 10, what it says, because Paul is writing. It reminds me of Paul writing to Israel and to their leaders. He says, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is, is that they may be saved. So Paul wanted Israel to be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God. So, so Israel was zealous. They would do lots of things for God. They were, they were out there doing things for God. But w- watch this, but not according to knowledge. So there was something that they didn't know. Now, was this knowledge important? Because not all knowledge is essential, but notice what he says, for being ignorant, they didn't know something. So this is a reference back to the knowledge that they didn't know. For being ignorant of God's righteousness. If there was something that you couldn't miss, if there was something that was so important that you cannot miss, it's God's righteousness as a Christian. And they were seeking, running about, zealous for God, doing all of these things. But, but they were ignorant. Ignorant of what? God's righteousness. And notice what it says, even worse. And seeking to establish their own righteousness. In other words, they didn't know about God's righteousness, but they went about to do these works in order to establish their own righteousness. They wanted to rely upon their own righteousness because they didn't really understand what Jesus had provided. Have not submitted 
to the righteousness of God. They, 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 they wouldn't surrender. They wouldn't submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Now, I want you to just grasp this because some people take this verse wrong. But what it's saying is, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. In other words, if you want righteousness, you don't go to the law, you go to Christ. And when you receive his righteousness, his spirit works in your life. You are accounted righteous and come into full communion with God. Praise God. So the Israelites were zealous for God. Maybe in church they were doing lots of things. Maybe there were leaders in church. I don't know. Lots of things for God. But they hadn't surrendered to God's righteousness. Well, I want to take you to the gospel tree. We believe that Jesus' atoning death has justified us has made us one with God. In fact, I've got a story, and you may have heard this story before, but I like this story. It's a story about a lady who met a man. In fact, the man, they were seeing each other for a while, and uh, this man, he one day, as men usually do, he got on his knee, and he proposed to the woman. And her heart was thrilled. He was good-looking. He was a nice man. He had a good job, and As he proposed to her, she said yes. And then, the you know, as it goes, the wedding is planned and the wedding is happening. And and what happens is she starts to uh, walk down the aisle and he is looking at her. And it's such a wonderful, wonderful wedding. And they get married and they go on the honeymoon. And the next morning uh, she wakes up and he's gone. And when he's gone, she feels around and she starts to look, where is he? And what happens is he has gone to the kitchen. And uh, she smells something and maybe he's cooking and he comes in with a tray. And on the tray, uh, there's a letter. She takes the letter and she opens the letter. And as she starts to read the letter, it's an interesting letter. And it says something like, uh, 6 a.m., wake up. 6.15, iron my shirt. 6.20, put the eggs on or the porridge. And it's got a schedule, you know, uh, later on in the day, it's got uh, uh, 5.30, have my dinner ready. You know, so he's he's helping her in life. Isn't that nice of him? So she's got the schedule and, and she's living her life and living her life and living and life for her becomes... And she, one day, about eight years later, he dies. And she has a celebration, I mean a funeral. eh? And when she has the the funeral and he, he goes, she says, I'm never getting married again. And she's at work one day and she notice looks across the work and she notices someone looking at her. And she knows that look. And she thinks, oh no, what am I going to do? And the relationship starts and and this man starts chasing her and asking her for lunch and asking her out. And, and eventually she kind of succumbs, but she doesn't want to get married because she's had marriage is this awful experience of all of these things I've got to do. And so what happens is uh, she eventually she finds and time goes on him, him on one knee. And as she's about to scream, she finds her, pops out of her mouth. Uh, okay she decides to get married and she's thinking, what am I doing? Do I really, really want to go through this again? And they get married and she's a bit tense, but, but it's a lovely day. They go away on the honeymoon and she wakes up in the morning and she puts her hand out and she's about to scream because he's not there. And then he comes in with a tray and she wants to grab the tray and hit him on the head with it. And she sees the letter and she's about to tear it up and she thinks, oh no. She'll read the letter and she opens the letter and it's, honey, I love you. And there's a beautiful poem. And as she lives with this man, it was a different experience. She's in love and and what a joy it was. And he was such a a lovely man. And, And one day she was going through her chest years later. And she opened the chest and she found not the second letter, but the first letter. 
And as she started to go through the ske- schedule that her first husband wrote, she was saying, oh, can you imagine getting up early to, to make him breakfast? And can you imagine? And she started, and then she started to think, hang on, I do get up early and I often make him breakfast. I do iron his shirts. I do get dinner ready for him. But you see, the difference was that she was in love. And you see the experience that Christ calls us to do. Don't, don't think that there won't be works that give glory to God. Amen. In our lives, there will be a manifestation of, of glory that we will glorify our Father, which is in heaven. But it's because we recognize the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We've received the reconciliation. We've received the fact that he's brought us back from the power of the enemy. And Christ starts to work a wonderful work in the life of the believer. In 1888, they were more worried about Christian character, things like sanctification and overcoming sin. But should they have been done that at the expense of justification? Now, I I could also put down their doctrines, and probably that was the most uh, strong and pressing aspect. But we always must put Jesus at the heart of everything we are and all that we believe. So they had a zeal, but were ignorant of God's righteousness. They were so zealous to do what was right, they were blinded. You know, it's almost like, remember, we have the law of Moses when Jesus come. That's what they would, they would cry out. They were so zealous that they wouldn't submit to God's righteousness. They wanted to hold on to their own and present it before God to recommend themselves to God. But all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. You cannot get righteousness, the righteousness of God from the law. It comes through Jesus Christ. What does it mean to believe? Now, I have a daughter. In fact, I have three daughters. I have two female dogs and I have a wife. So you can imagine my home. If I leave the toilet seat up, I'm in big, big trouble. Eh? Everything in my home is female. One particular daughter, she is strong-minded She is, well, all of my girls are strong-minded, but uh, she is challenging and a bit of a hard case. I wonder where she gets that from. And often she was difficult growing up. Not not real difficult. My girls have been a blessing. They've been good girls. I'm I'm very blessed by that. But there were certain times where she was challenging and I would discipline her and and, and she would get upset with me and I'd discipline her and and she'd be up, you know, we'd have, and I, I, in my heart, I knew something was wrong. And, and one day my daughter came to me and she said, Dad, she was about eight or nine at the time. I said, yes, honey. She said, it's not going to work. I said, what's not going to work, darling? She said, the way that you discipline me, it's not going to work. It's just going to, it's just going to make me more strong minded against what you want. And you know, this from an eight or nine year old giving me parenting tips, eh? The, the, the point is though, that deep in my heart, I knew what she was saying was true. I knew that in my mind, the way it was going, it, it, it wasn't going to work. I was just going to build rebellion inside of her. And so I sat down, I said, so, so what, what do we do, darling? And so she starts to tell me how I can be a better father, <laughs> But she was right. She said, we need to talk about how we're going to do this. And so as she started to talk to me and we started to talk, I started to listen. And, and as difficult as it was, I said, okay, honey, I'm going to try. I'm going to be a better dad and I'll do things differently and I'll listen to you. And so we had this discussion. And, you know, eventually what happened was I won her heart. Our hearts kind of connected and when our hearts connected you know uh, after that happened when I wanted something done guess who was the first to do it when I needed help for something guess who was the first to respond when I asked somebody to do something guess who was the first to to go and do it she was showing me what I had shown her 
she had seen love in my heart and our hearts had been reconciled, united. Friends, when we're talking about belief, notice what Romans 10 says, For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. When we believe not only with our head but with our heart, When we move from that place of just having head knowledge to actually fully appreciating and knowing the heart of our Father toward us, it changes us. It changes the relationship. We become rooted and grounded. We become one with God. Do you believe with your head and your heart? In fact, we're told that we should spend a thoughtful hour a day contemplating the life of Christ, especially the closing scenes, that we may set our affections, and this is my words, on the cross. It's a heart work with God. Where is your heart? How is your heart with God? Well, it means... We are called to stop and appreciate what Jesus has done. Don't just do church. Spend time with your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, James White uh, received the picture, got a picture from Dr. M. G. Callot sometime in the early 70s. They don't know the original artist, but James White found the picture to be such a vivid, portrayal of the plan of salvation that he had it published as early as 74, 1874 and advertised in the Review and Herald as an allegorical picture it was named Showing the Way of Life and Salvation Through Jesus Christ from Paradise Lost to Paradise Restored. Two years later, in October 1876, they printed a thousand copies of a new and improved edition with an explanatory a brochure it was published now here is the picture in fact you may have seen it before and if you look closely at the picture you'll find uh, Adam and Eve being kicked out of the garden you'll see Cain and Abel and Abel is on the ground and Cain is fleeing the scene you'll see the sanctuary service you see up in the corner there the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven you'll notice the last supper You'll see the baptism there, baptism of Christ. And you'll notice uh, the cross under the law tree. You'll notice the cross under the law tree. By the way, the cross is under the law tree. And, 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 What we know happened four years later, James White began planning a new picture. Something didn't sit right with him. With a change in emphasis, this is what he wrote to Ellen White in March of 1880. And this is about a year before he dies. I I have a sketch of the new picture. Behold the Lamb of God. This differs from the way of life in these particulars. The law tree is removed. Christ on the cross is made larger and placed in the center. In other particulars, it is about the same, excepting the baptism scene and the city will be very much improved. He planned to entitle it, it, Christ, the way of life, from paradise lost to paradise restored. However, he dies in August 6, 1881, and it was left to Ellen White with the help of her sons to fulfill his plan in 1883 when she copyrighted a new steel plate engraving. The new picture placed Christ on the cross as the dominating center of the plan of salvation. Now notice, this was the old picture. And this was the new picture. This, you can see the difference. And when you have a look over You can see Adam and Eve leaving the garden. You can see Cain again with Abel. You can see the sanctuary service. You can see the Last Supper and the baptism of Christ. You can 
see, you don't see the law, but you see Mount Sinai symbolizing the Ten Commandments. But right at the center, you see Jesus Christ. And so this was symbolic of the shift that the church was making toward a more central place with Jesus Christ as the center. Notice what James White said, My husband understood this matter, should be connected with her reflections of James White's comments just prior to his death in 1881, it is a duty which we owe to ourselves and to the cause of God to rest from the heat of battle. So what was happening was they were so busy running around at work and to give our, to our people the precious light of truth which has opened to our mi minds. I feel assured there is a crisis before us. We should preserve our physical and mental powers for future service. The glorious subject of redemption should long ago have been more fully presented to the people. In other words, James White is saying we should have been more clear about this. And he regretted them spending so much time on other things. But praise the Lord for the picture, Amy, because it becomes a symbol of where God was taking his church. And by the time we get to the shaking, you are going to see very clearly why God was taking his church to that position. The picture shifts. From 1874 to 1883. From 1874 to 1883. You know, I had the privilege of serving. I was serving in Australia. Uh, Australia was good to us. All of our children were born in Australia, even though uh, I, <laughs> you know, as a Kiwi, we give the Australians a hard time. But we were blessed to be there. And what ended up happening was I was working in a particular church there. It was a big church. It was a good church. In fact, it was a wonderful uh, first few years in ministry for me. And we were there. And I lived in a certain area. I lived in a place called Wesley. Wesley. And uh, I didn't realize, but one Sunday morning, I got a knock at my door. And when I got that knock, I went to the door and I said, hello, and I answered the door. And it was a man, he wasn't a big man, but he said to me, hi, I'm your neighbor. I live behind you. I said, oh, th that's great. And I was wondering if I'd done something. And uh, he said to me, I have a problem. I said, okay. He said, one of your church members is causing an issue in one of my properties. I said, yes. He said, there is a, a, a smell in my properties and what he had was he had a, a he had a house which was divided in two and then there was another house down the back so he had these three properties and 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 this person was in this property and the smell was traveling throughout all the properties and he was causing problems and i said okay and he said yeah he said it, it, it's such a such a big pro big problem he said can you help me and i said okay i said what do you want me to do and he said could you uh, uh get him out of the house and i said okay I'm thinking, how do I get him out of the house? Now, the man he was talking about, well, he was a big man. An older man, not, not real old, but he was a big man. And, and I thought, okay, I'll go. So I went around to the house. And when I went around uh, to the house, I knocked on the door and no one answered. Knocking on the door, no one is answering. I said, is anyone there? And I thought I heard a faint help. And so I kind of pushed the door open. And as I pushed the door open, a cra it cracked open. And now the smell came in and I, I could smell a little bit. And I said, ooh. I said, is anyone there? He said, I, I then could hear a louder help. So I pushed the door open. When I pushed the door open, I looked on the ground. And when I looked on the ground, it was number one everywhere, like stains. You could, you could see stains. Um, and, and now the smell was, was really was starting to you know, um, come into my nostrils. And, and so I said, is anyone there? And I could hear him. And so I walked in. And as I walked in, I looked to the right. And on the right, there was a doorway. And in the doorway, I could see kind of the edge of a bed. And on the edge of the bed, I could see the corner of a sheet. 
as if something had rolled off the other side of the bed. And so I started walking toward the bedroom. I said, is anyone there? And now I could hear him. He said, yes, help. And so as I went in and I looked around the bed, down the side of the bed, here was the man. And he was lying there. And as he's lying there, he's lying naked. And by the way, he, he, he had uh, um, a prosthetic leg and it wasn't on. And so he's lying down naked there and he's, he weighs maybe 140, 150 kilos. And he's lying there, he's a big man. And I'm thinking, well, you know, I wish because what I noticed was he wasn't lying only in number one, he was lying in number two. And what I noticed was that, and I was thinking, Ooh, I wish I could have just taken my two fingers and picked them up and gone like that. But in order to get him up on the bed, I had to squat down and bring his back close to, close to my body, and then get under his arms, and then squat up, and then roll him onto the bed. My body had to come really close to his body. And as I rolled him onto the bed, I said, are you okay? And he said, I'm thirsty. I said, what do you, what do you want? He says, I, I said, I'll get you some water. He said, I want my Coke. I said, I'll get you some water. He said, I want my Coke. And so instead of arguing with him, I said, okay, I'll, I'll get you the coke so I went and got him the coke and then I walked outside and now I'm trying to breathe because phew, I can smell it and, and I'm standing under the carport and the owner comes and he says oh what's happening and I said oh I've got him into the bed uh, and, and I call I think I first called my pastor and he said call the ambulance so I called the, we called the ambulance and the ambulance was coming on my like, trying to breathe and I said to the the owner I said man I said the smell is so bad I said it's almost as if it's gone up my nostrils and 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 it's and it's stuck there and he looked at me from my toes all the way up. And he said, it's not in your nostrils. And then I remember driving home because obviously the mess was all over me. My car windows were down. The air was flowing in and I was trying to breathe. And I remember throwing the shirt away. But that night, I started to get phone call after phone call. And I got several phone calls from his family. And they said, thank you so much for saving him thank you for what you did and I, I don't know if it saved him I'm not sure what would have happened to him but I remember the last phone call thank you so much for what you did you saved his life da, da, da. and I put the phone down and when I put the phone down I'll never forget I felt this impression and it was you picked him up but I would have picked him up and cleaned him up and I kind of had a picture of him being showered and washed and bathed you know, God delights in taking us in our mess and rejoicing over us and, and, and bringing us close to him and then taking us and washing us and cleansing us from all of our mess. It's the delight of our Father's heart. And today I want to really encourage you, let our minds be, be reminded of that. In our experience with God, let us always remember that we have a God who loves us and has provided justification. He's provided righteousness. He's provided power. He's provided blood that cleanses and washes us from all sins. That's the God that we serve. We don't need to have an experience where we try to earn that approval. He has already given himself wholly for you. The only acceptable offering is found in Jesus Christ. We are called to move from being zealous to trying to do it ourselves. Move away from the zeal and fully embrace Christ and experience the real. May that be your experience today. Will you believe in Jesus with your head and your heart? Will you rejoice in the cross? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for shifting, for changing. We sometimes, even in our lives, we, we're zealous to do things for you, but help us to rejoice and to bathe and marinate in the glory of the cross. Help us to never forget the power of God is found in the righteousness of God, in the gospel. 
We thank you for achieving this wonderful work that you have done, the life, death, and your resurrection. We look forward to seeing you again, but we just pause and say, Lord, we accept you in Jesus' name. Bless every heart that hears this, we pray. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen. Looking forward to seeing you part three. Don't miss it. It's going to get even better. God bless you.